Aloha Kako. My name is uh, my name is Kyla. Um, I'm from Waimea Valley. I'm an educator there, and I'm really excited to be here with you folks today. Um, as I do with every uh, place that I go to speak, it's very important for my ohana and for many ohana and the place that I come from, so the moku of Waialua, to introduce themselves as far as where uh, their mountains, their streams, and their oceans are. These things, they make us what we are. You are what you eat. You are where you come from. And so that's why we announce them every time we go somewhere. So my mountain is Pupukea. Um, a lot of people know that mountain to be a part of the Ko'olau Loa and the Ko'olau Poko mountain chain, and they are. Uh, my streams are Ka'ivikoele, Kamananui, and Elehaha. And my ocean is called, um, oh my god, goodness, I am <laughs> getting so nervous all of a sudden. <laughs> my ocean is um, Kulalua, so that's the current that's outside of my ocean. A lot of people know that beach as Keiki Beach, so that's where I grew up and was almost born in, <laughs> and, but I was raised there for sure. So today the information that I brought to share with you folks is a topic of interest that I uh, picked up quite a few years ago. We were raised with this information and then it was actually presented by Kale Nu'uhiva at a Hawaiian topic of interest forum called uh, Aimalama. Has anybody heard of that conference before? It was held at UH Manoa and it was a Hawaiian moon conference that invited a lot of environmental speakers to come in and talk about uh, what we are planning to do in different environmental agencies or like-minded agencies for conservation. Everybody heard of that one? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it was a couple, a couple years ago. They are actually going to hold the new one in Maui this year. So August of, um, on Maui Island, they are going to have the second annual Aimalama uh, conference. So this information that I'm going to be sharing with you, like most uh, indigenous information, doesn't come from me. It comes from an accumulation of knowledge from our ancestors. And so it's a compilation of all different beliefs. A lot of people uh, know our canon authors like Malo, Kamakau, Ii, Papa, those ones. Um, some of this information does come from them. Uh, some of it comes from Pukui, and we're going to talk about that as we go through. So this is Ale Manakamahina, or the Hawaiian moon calendar. And um, this is my first slide. So the moon affects our plane of existence. We are definitely influenced by the gravitational pull, but not as much as uh, social contexts lead us to believe. So has anybody ever heard the term lunatic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so lunatic actually derives from a saying that has to do with the lunar phases. Uh, that the gravitational pull of the moon does affect us, but it's more socially and psychologically than it is actually physically uh, affecting us. What it does affect is the distribution of the tides. So wherever the moon is, on the plane of the earth in relevance to where we are, the moon is actually pulling the tides either in the middle of the earth, constricting this way laterally, or it's pulling it at some kind of angle. And so that's why we get low tides and high tides during the day. Now when it does that, of course, it's pulling on the ocean, but it's also pulling on all kinds of water. So the second most affected organism uh, in our plane of existence is the flora and fauna of your environment. So how many of you guys ha like to go outside on full moon nights? Does anybody ever do that? Okay. How many of you guys have gone outside on nights where there's no moon or very little moonlight? Does anybody ever take notice in what's happening to the plants? 
No, okay, so sometimes, well, most of the time actually, if you look at a plant on a full moon versus no moonlight, you'll actually see that there is a difference in how this plant is standing. And that is because the plant is photosynthesizing. So actually plants, rather than photosynthesizing in the sun, they photosynthesize better in the moonlight. Everybody knows what photosynthesizing is, right? Okay, so plants intaking energy and opening up their pores to get water to come down into the cells. And if you can't tell, I am a plant nerd. So <laughs> I will be talking about plants throughout this <laughs> quite a bit. But plants are actually more erect on full moon nights and they are more lackadaisical on nights that are not full. And the reason usually is because of, yes, that water content that gets pulled by that gravitational force. Animals, which are fauna, <coughs> they act quite a bit different on full, full moon nights as well. So animals, when there's more light, even if they're not nocturnal, but especially nocturnal animals, they will stay up later. They'll hunt longer into the night. And one of the Hawaiian sayings about full moons is that the rats are more active. So it, like last night, I could hear so many rats out on my farm. And I made an indication in my moon journal because we're constantly observing these things and trying to understand what our ancestors were recording and why they were recording it. So plants and animals, they slightly change their behavior because of the moon. Now people, we're 75% water. We do have and feel, experience a change when the moon is full rather than when it's not. But that change that we experience is like one fourth of a paper clip. Like, so the, the amount of the change that it actually physically affects us is not very much at all. How it does affect us is physiological. So social construct, uh, cultural construct, they act, they make us behave differently depending upon what we have been raised to believe about the full moon. How many of you guys know a legend or a superstition or a wives tale or something about the moon that when it's full? Do you know one? Yeah? Um, I don't know. In my country, it said that if it's a full moon, Yeah, yeah, there are, there are a lot of stories like that. How many of you guys have heard of the statistics of having more accidents in the emergency room on full moon nights? Or the police reporting that they actually arrest more people on full moon nights? So these things aren't actually physical, but because we grow up hearing stories like, the full moon makes you crazy, then people actually do behave a little bit more differently like Pavlok's dog. Okay, so this is a basic Hawaiian astronomical concept. It, we have many more, a lot, a lot more. Hawaiians actually uh, developed quite an extensive system that they used to study their atmosphere. They depended on what was going on in the astrological, playing quite a lot. So, uh, this is a basic one that kind of gives you an understanding of where Hawaiian situated what was going on in space. So everybody see this realm right here, Pa'ai Luna? So Pa'ai Luna is reserved for things like the sun, planets, stars, and the moon. They're things that change, but they don't change erratically. They're pretty constant. You can kind of position where they're going or determine where they're going or predict where they're going after a period of study. And then you guys see this one, Leva. Leva indicates the area where clouds, um, the changing color of these clouds, birds, anything in the lower atmosphere 
was delegated to the leva area. So all deep space is Pa'iluna, leva is here. And then Pa'ilalo would be heat, would be moisture, would be anything that was happening directly above your head. That's how it's described. Not too far above your head. So if you're in experiencing increased humidity, that would be something that's in your Pa'ilalo. And then, of course, it would correspond to the other realms as it got further and further up into them digesting, or Hawaiians, us, digesting the fact that a certain cloud was causing the humidity. And then digesting that a certain month was causing that certain cloud. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. So this is from Kepelino's Traditions of Hawaii. And it's much older than 1932, but that's when it was translated into a bulletin in Bishop Museum. And so this figure is called the Triple Heaven of the Hawaiians. Very simplistic representation, but a good one to introduce people into. So this is the Ale Manakamahina, and we are going to be talking about the Malama, which translates into Poi Haole, roughly, or English, as month. Then we're going to be talking about the Anahulu, which translates into week, Kaulana Mahina, which is the moon phase, and then Napo Akapu, who the night belongs to. So the moons and the nights actually belong to different people. And this helped Hawaiian people kind of coordinate their schedule. So the purpose of the Ale Manaka Mahina was to plan out things to make sure that the month was actually being utilized as much as possible. It had much more complex purposes, but that's a basic con uh, concept for someone like a fisherman or a farmer. That's what an ale manaka mahina would be used for. So these are our malama. There are actually two sets of malama. So the Hawaiians split their year into two periods of six months each. Can you guys tell when it's spring here in Hawaii? How about when it's fall? No, no. <laughs> so especially for people who are not from here, uh, who haven't been taught to notice those changes, it's pretty difficult to discern between summer and spring and fall and winter for people who are not uh, from Hawaii. And even if you are from Hawaii, it gets pretty difficult. The only reason why I know is because we grew up hunting and fishing. And so certain things coming dur during certain th times means that it's a different month. So these are the Ho'oilo months. Ho'oilo means rain. It's a period of lots and lots of rain. And uh, these start in November, Vele, or October in the Velehu Malama. So remember, Malama means month. And then ends about Velo, which actually means hot. And that's about March 28th, April 26th. The reason why we have the variance of the dates is because it depends on the moon cycle for that year. So sometimes Hawaiians actually had 13 months, sometimes they had 12. 13 months were actually inserted every three to four years, and that's like our leap year for Hawaiians. So they inserted an additional month instead of an additional. Um, okay. So in the Ho'owilo winter months, a lot of things were restricted. During these months, because of the rain, we harvested a lot of things, and these times had their own markings as well. So does anybody know how to tell it's Christmas time here in Hawaii in the Hawaiian way? Any? Hmm? When people start singing. That's true. When people start singing, when people start decorating, very good. You guys want to know how I know it's Christmas time here in Hawaii? <laughs> it is. And even if you don't want to know, I'm going to tell you anyways. <laughs> so at Waimea Valley, we have sugar cane. There's about 30 different to 40 different types of Hawaiian heirloom sugar cane. And when the sugar cane flowers, has anybody ever seen a sugar cane flower? It looks like a corn flower. It's all stocky. It looks like a top of a wheat or something like that. When the sugar cane flowers, 
the he'e, the squid, are in the ocean. And that's how I know it's Christmas time. <laughs> that is an environmental indicator that corresponds with ho'owilo. Now this is Calvella. Oh, hey, Kalamai, one more thing. Everybody see this star way high up in the corner? Okay, that is the Makali'i. The Makali'i is the Pleiades. So not only are our months delegated by the seasons, they're also, they follow stars. So the Makali'i, the Pleiades, it rises about November 13th, and then it sets about March, mm, the end of March, the very beginning of April. And when it does that, we know that it's Ho'owilo. Now this is Calvella. Calvella are the hot months. The Calvella months are when you go out and fish, when you plant and get ready for harvest time, when you can go to war in ancient Hawaii, <laughs> not today. And when you practiced a lot of fishing and periods of not fishing. And so you can see there's on this line here with the poipoi, these are the kapu on aku is lifted, kapu on opelo is placed. So the months helped us also regulate our finite resources that we had to use sustainably. All right, so the Calvello months, they start in April. In around May with Iki Iki and that's as you can see is when you prep your nets well for this year it was and then it ends around sep September October and it's here coordinated with the Manaya Kalani star set so this is a star set in the Scorpius constellation set Manaya Kalani is the name of Maui's fish hook so um, there's a whole legend about how it got up there and how Maui lost it. And that is um, our summer constellation. So you know it's summertime when Manaya Kalani is in the sky. All right, so we're gonna move on to our Anahulu. Our Anahulu are marked actually by the waxing, the full, and the waning moon phases. So Hawaiian month actually runs into the middle of the Gregorian month. In a Gregorian month, and this is gonna get a little bit hard to conceptualize, I'll show you in a little bit. We'll go back to a slide where it kind of breaks it apart and makes it easier to see. So a Gregorian month has four weeks. A Hawaiian month has three. In a Hawaiian month, each week actually consists of 10 moon phases, so 10 days instead of seven. And these follow the waxing, the full, and the waning moon phases. So the first anahulu, the first week, is called ho'onui. And ho'onui means to grow. And then all of the other words behind that are vehe vehe. Hawaiian language has a lot of contextual <laughs> meanings and a lot of kauna. And so that means there's a lot of uh, poetical meanings as well. So to increase, to gain, etc. This is the term for the waxing moon phases that are increasing in illumination and under half illumination. So these are the ho'onui moon phases. Then we go to the anahulu of the poi poi, which we are in right now. So the poi poi means round, rounded, circular, compressed, compacted, basically just really full. Ho'onui is getting up to that. So it's growing to be the poi poi's, the full. These are the terms for the full moon phases. So all of the full moons and the moons, the two moons leading up to that and the three moons after are included in the Poi Poi Anahulu this week. And then our last week is Ho'oemi. Ho'oemi means to diminish, reduce, depreciate, grow smaller. And these are the terms for the waning moon phases that are decreasing in illumination and eventually rising into the shadow of the sun. And that's why you get that big old chunk taken out of the moon when it's getting smaller. It rises in the shadow of the sun and that reflects onto the moon. So that makes it really, really dark. So the Ho'oemi are the end of our moon phases right before we go back into Ho'onui and renew the whole entire Anahulu. So sometimes our Malama, 
run into the middle of Gregorian months, and that's why you'll see September, October, August, September as one month. Now these are our Anahulu. So the top, Ho'onui, the middle, Poipoi, poi, and the end, Ho'oemi. So it makes a little bit more sense to see it that way rather than to try and imagine 10 day weeks instead of seven day weeks. The moons are grouped, yes? Uh, which moon thing is poi um, planted? Is poi planted? I mean, like, uh, you mean kalo? Huh? Kalo? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. we can get into that on this slide. So everybody see the green square with the moon phases in it? There's about four. Those are ku cool moons. Ku cool moons, ku cool refers to erect. Those are really great nights to plant on. Anything that is going to grow straight up and tall. Kalo does that. So things like sugar cane, kalo, trees, anything like that can be planted on the ku nights. So this slide shows how the moons are grouped and what they're used for. So I'm going to go over the groupings and just tell you a brief kind of summary of what you can and what you're not supposed to do on the moons. So everybody see Hilo and Hoaka? Hilo and Hoaka, these two moons here, they're not in a set. They're both individual. Hilo is a really good night for things. It's a new moon. So it means that you can try to do new things. It's an okay planting day, but it's not the greatest. Everybody see Hoaka, the moon right next to it? That's a no-no for planting. Hoaka is a hiding moon. If you plant things on the Hoaka moon, you will see that they won't grow up to be big like you need them to be. Like for say, uh, example is if you were gonna plant a sweet potato on a Hoaka moon, it won't be as big as if you were going to, it would be if you were going to plant it on a full moon face. And that has to do with the actual physical construction of the plant and how it um, gets its nutrients, how it photosynthesizes. So the green square talks about our ku moons. These moons are very good for lots of different kinds of plantings, but mostly trees. And these moons are not so great for fishing. The reason why is because they're under half illumination and the currents are kind of erratic. So they get a little crazy. The winds get a little crazy too. You guys see the round purple oval over there? So that's the ole moons. There are two sets of ole moons in the moon phase in the month. So the purple and the yellow here are both ole moons. Ole moons are a series of moons that you didn't actually want to do anything on. They were moons that you didn't want to plan anything new. You didn't even want to discuss anything new. They were moons that you prepped, that you fixed, and that you rested on. So they actually allowed people to follow things, um, not harvest, and you knew they were coming. So when they came, you, you already were prepped for that occurrence. When the ole moons are here, you're not supposed to test or try to learn any new information either. So if, it's kind of funny if you actually do have a test on the ole moon and you're struggling with it. In Hawaiian studies, we always go, well, Kumu, we can't have a test on this day because it's the ole moon, so no one's going to do well. <laughs> yes. So um, you said that um, we're not allowed to try or talk about anything new in specific things, right? So <clears throat> on the new moon, is that where they would have like town gatherings and see um, what to do next kind of thing? Sometimes. Most of the time, because Hilo is the actually name of a great navigator, new moons were creations of good ideas to come. Better moons to meet and have town gatherings would be the full moons. So the full moons, yes, they have this stipulation of making people crazy, making people a little bit too overproductive, ghosts and werewolves coming out. For Hawaiians, the full moons were great nights for meetings. They were great nights for tests. They were great nights to go and invest into endeavors. All kinds of things, especially planting and fishing, were efficient, the most efficient on full moons. And that's because the gravitational pull, because of the increased amount of light that was available to people 
all kinds of things. You guys see the La'au moons in the blue oval? Those moons are good for La'au Lapa'au, which is plant medicine. So people would go and harvest La'au Lapa'au on the La'au moons. And doctors would try to do medicine or prep or plant medicine on these moons because of some part of the gravitational pull was just better for their specific medicines. Everybody see the red right down here? These are the Kaloas, the Loa moons or the long moons. These moons are good for planting trees, anything that is woody or long, like a sweet potato or like a melon vine, things like that. So these moons were all set up with intent. They were all set up as a plan kind of how to delegate the Hawaiian month. And people didn't always believe in this. You'll find that throughout Hawaiian literature and history that there are variances of even when the months are, depending on the island. Did you guys know that the months for like Kauai and Maui are completely different from the months for Oahu? We have them all scattered all over the place. And that's because Hawaiian language is very contextual. It has to do with where you come from. That's why if you hear something different in Hawaiian knowledge, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means it comes from a different house of knowledge. It comes from a different place where that's actually applicable. One um, modern example I like to give is that in the DLNR, they like to restrict fishing to specific sides of the island. Well the same fishing restrictions for Waikiki would not be applicable in my area. If you were allowed to harvest 30 fish from Waikiki of a specific kind, but they came and harvested 30 of that same fish from my beach, it wouldn't be, it, you would destroy that population of fish for me. So for the Ahupua'a or the land divisions, for the Moku, for the counties, and even for the island, things need to be different based off of their observances of their natural environment, what affects them, where they come from, what they grow and what they eat. This is the Napo Kapu. The Napo Kapu are, yes? Is it like a sailing moon as well? Oh yeah, Hilo is great for sailing because it is the new moon, so things are kind of calm. Uh, the full moons aren't that great for sailing because they make things really extreme. If the, f if the waves are going to be big, they're extremely big on the full moons. If the waves are going to be small, they're extremely small. Same thing with winds and all things like that. So like the ancient Hawaiians would go out on, on Hilo? On specific nights. Most of the time, yes. Most of the time you would find that they would definitely go on the Kane, Lono, Mauli, and Mukus. Dark nights were good for sailing. The reason why is because we corresponded our actual correspondence, <laughs> our um, latitude, longitude with stars. So it was easier to see those stars and make those calculations when it was darker. So of course you would run into moons, especially if you were going on a long sailing journey, but you would definitely begin on a moon that was a little bit darker to plan out your coordination a little bit better. Yes. So the so that's so that's getting into a period of Hawaiian religion. Those actually came. Those delegations came with a later period of religion that started after the 1000 A.D.s. So uh, when Pa'au came to the Hawaiian Islands, the Tahitian priest that bought the cup, brought the kapu system to us. Uh, it's a little bit more extensive. I can talk to you about that after. But most definitely in the longest term of Hawaiian religion and Hawaiian law based off of the kapu system, that religion, we did not have war during the winter time and we did have war during the summer. Or that was the beneficial time. No one warred in the winter. And that's because it was dedicated to a god that did not approve of warfare. He was actually a god of harvest, families, peace, agriculture, medicine, things like that. 
that whole season was dedicated to him. But that was not always so. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> okay, so everybody see the Nepal Kapuaku? This whole entire section of moons are dedicated to Ku. So you see Ku Kahi, Ole Ku Lua, and all of these. The moons here, they all are dedicated to that god Ku, and god, the god Ku is actually a god of man. And so he is really beneficial to starting and creating new things. Of course, on the Oleku moons, you wouldn't do anything, but those nights are all dedicated to Ku, so not the moons. Uh, you guys see the middle? These are Nepal Kapu Ahua. So when we say Nepal, we're talking about nights because the moons are actually given to specific people and those people are hinted in the moon's names. So like, for example, Hua. The Hua moon is actually in coordination with a Hua goddess. Kane, the Kane moon is in coordination with the Kane god, Lono. But these are all dedicated to Kane. The nights are, not the moons. It's a little confusing. This gets a little bit more into diving deeper into the Hawaiian social construct as well as their religious practices. But it's important to know because it delegates how you act or what you can plant or what you can do on those moons, even if you didn't believe in that god. Because different Hawaiians believed in different gods and they had family gods too. So these are the moons that are dedicated to the specific gods. Uh, these are the nights that are dedicated to the specific gods. Kane, Kanaloa, Hua is a female deity, and Ku. And so we're missing Lono, but Lono actually has his own moon. And then the last slide is, why is this important to us? So a little bit about why I teach the moon phases, and then I'd love to hear from you guys. So what's, why this is important to me, or why this is important to Waimea Valley, is because at this point in time in the world, we're experiencing a heightened amount of environmental changes. Whether you believe in global warming, or those kinds of things or not, we are experiencing differences and those differences are re being recorded by indigenous groups all over the world. Now today, I work with a lot of children uh, all from all over the island, from even different parts of the country. When kids come into the valley, they tell me, I didn't know a carrot grew in the ground. I didn't know that birds didn't live in cages. I didn't know that water doesn't come from a sink. And these kids are in all they're coming in as all different ages. And we're starting to see that kids are having a lapse of interaction with their environment. How many of you guys got to go outside and play in the rain when you were little? And your parents thought that that was an okay thing. Today, kids are kept inside when it's raining. Today, kids aren't allowed to get muddy. You'd be surprised how many kids come to the valley and they're wearing really nice shoes on a field trip that they were told that they were gonna get muddy on and they tell me, well, we can't get muddy. My parents just bought me these shoes. Kids today have a lapse of interaction with their environment. And so we try to teach them indigenous science tools to go along with 21st century technology because that allows you to have a better interaction, a better relationship with your environment, which is really where your sciences are based off of. That's where you start to inquire about things. That's where you start to develop a healthy uh, curiosity and where you make your first hypotheses when you're little and you're outside in your garden and you're asking you know, your parent how come a butterfly or a caterpillar turns into a butterfly? If we continue to see a lapse of interaction with children in their environment, then we could see possibly a lapse of creation of things that help our environment because there won't be a need. 
And so we try to teach these kids how to interact by using their senses. And one of the most important things that they can do is use these senses to observe. And so we're teaching them about the moon phases, how the moon phases can affect them. We're teaching them about their environment, about their water, about what happens when you pollute, about what happens when you make a change in any form, that there is some kind of reaction that is going to come about from that, and that there's also consequences from that reaction. And so that's why this is important to me and why it's important to Waimea Valley. Did you guys have any comments or questions? I know it's a lot and we can go back over anything if you might want me to repeat something that you didn't catch up. Do you have any comments about the eclipse from last night? So last night, um, I was telling your professor that last night was a blue blood f double full moon in one month eclipse that only happens 150 every 150 years so the occurrence that happened last night at 3:30 in the morning that's when the moon rose uh, the moon was actually red instead of blue it was pretty interesting i think that was uh, due to the clouds that we had in the area that I was observing the moon at. It was really, really close because it's in its beginning cycle of moving around the Earth. And it was really bright and uh, it lasted, it stayed in the same place for a very long time. Now, interestingly enough, the blue moon as well as the blood moon happens because of an occurrence within the Gregorian calendar. So most indigenous people who don't function off of the Gregorian calendar don't recognize it as being a special event. What they do recognize is that the moon's full and it's really close and it's a different color. And so that gets indicated. Even though now today we do know uh, what eclipses are and you know what they fun what their function is and that they're really neat to observe for many indigenous people eclipses weren't actually observed throughout history and there's not really a clear answer as to why if you go and read through it's just one of those social taboos that they just didn't do so like you'll see a lot of first nations a lot of um, nations from africa a lot of nations from South America and even Hawaiians didn't participate in viewing eclipses in any form. Probably because solar eclipses, I guess. That's my attempt at an educated guess. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or comments or concerns? <laughs> no? Okay, so there is definitely more to this whole entire um, moon calendar. I do try to deconstruct it as best as I can because I'm giving this information to children of all ages. And so I have a grouping of information, a planting chart, um, a deconstruction of how to interpret the moons, and even a moon calendar by my favorite Kaulana Mahina or moon observation person named um, Kalei Nu'uhiva. Yes? Could you comment more about um, how the moon affects uh, tides and things in relation to maybe more surfing? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, like I said, the full moons are extreme. So they make currents be extreme. Uh, the ole moons are erratic. So they can be varied based off of what was happening during that day. Um, they also change really quickly. So you'll see a lot of people fishing on ole moons even though they're not supposed to today. And I guess that's because they like the change in the wind and they like the change in the currents. I wouldn't go fishing on an ole moon, but that's just me. Um, good moons. For calm seas are definitely Hilo. Hilo's a good moon for that. The Ku moons are good moons for that. And anything dedicated to Kanaloa. So all the long moons, the Kaloa moons. Kanaloa is a god of the deep ocean for Hawaiian people. And so a lot of ocean arts were practiced 
um, not so much at nighttime. I have heard of surfing at nighttime, but of course the moon affects us during the day too. But the Kaloa moons are pretty good for long, long waves and ocean activities, as far as I know. Yes? What's the process like to, so like you said a lot of this is a collection of knowledge from our ancestors. It is. Um, so how do you separate from like what's superstition to religious to practical knowledge that you can use for like plant growth, um, like cycles of the waves and um, like certain, you know, you know what I mean? Yes. What can, how, how, what's the process of you funneling that, or how has the professional community funneled that information into widely more used information? So what we do is we are currently making observations. So all of this information, has, do you guys know what the Olelo no Eau book is? It's the Hawaiian proverb book. A lot of this information comes from there. A lot of this information comes from times where uh, Hawaiians were learning to read and write when they were having their newspapers and they could print their individual interests into their newspapers. Because at one point in time, Hawaii was the most literate state in the whole entire United States. And at one point in time, it was the most literate state in the whole entire country um, or countries at one point in time when they first were introduced to newspapers and the written word. So we are taking all of that information, we're analyzing it, and people in like-minded organizations such as Waimea Valley are actually testing it. So we have moon journals and we write what's important to us and what we observe in our area. And so not only are we testing what was given to us by our ancestors, but we're also compiling new information on top of that. Because what we have come to understand is that what our ancestors recorded then may be different from what we're seeing now. And that could be due, due to the change in the earth. Our poles alter and change, our weather alters and change. We kind of, you know, move along the axis of the earth in a couple of degrees every couple thousand years. And so we are finding that as we make our observations and teach our youth to make observations, that we're changing things. Uh, I have a, a sailing family in Big Island and they have sailed every weekend ever since I have known them and my parents have known them from Waimea to Kona. And they always go around a certain time because they know it's safe and because they know there's a wind that will take them there. And they always leave Kona at a certain time because they know there's a wind that will take them back. They know the name of this wind. They know where it's coming from in the direction. It's a normal wind that has been coming along this coast for as long as they've been using it to travel. Recently, this wind has changed. It has altered. And they're noticing that as they are sailing, that they either get a lapse of wind and they get stuck in the middle of Kona and Kauaihai, or they're noticing that they're just not even experiencing that wind, so they don't leave until they get another one. We're seeing these kinds of changes and we're adapting to them because that's what indigenous people have to do. Uh, indigenous people are their environment. Their environment delegates what they do. And so if their environment is changing, they have to change along with their environment in order to survive. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you. No problem. <laughs>